getting some of the more precise, like not getting this deep, I guess, so try to kind of cover more information, um, and get, get exposed to more things than maybe um, taking, like going to deeper into the chapter. So um, this chapter is probably going to just be notes this week, and then we'll test early next week. So if you're struggling, you got to ask questions right away. So um, both of you guys online, let me know. If we need to schedule something, Google Meet or something, if you're struggling, send me an email roll. Immediately we'll figure something out soon. Any questions? We're all good on this? Is that okay? All right. So. Just a reminder also, if you haven't been using your AR sign um, very purposefully, um, that's also a good time to come get help if you're afraid to ask the question in class because you're like, well, no one else has questions. Probably really not the case, but um, feel free to let me know if you guys want to come see me during AR. Um, my AR is a very small group and they're very quiet, so I'd definitely be glad to help you. I think yesterday I had like four students in there, so um, I'd be glad to have you guys. All right, so there's a couple of warm-up questions, and it's actually a little bit of ACT practice. I know a lot of times you guys hear ACT and automatically on its own because we talk about it so much, but obviously it's kind of a big important task we end up taking. And we are doing things to get us ready for the ACT all the time, so sometimes seeing those questions written in that format is good for you guys. You want to take a minute to look. These are two like ACT, SAT practice questions. So we could see something like this on those tests. And those should be problems you guys are comfortable with doing. With something like the ACT, you only have so much time to do a test like this. I hope on something like the ACT, you look at a question like number one here, and you can eliminate a few choices right away. What do we know immediately about the slope in number one? Yeah, it's positive. positive. We talked about the slope either going uphill or downhill, um, or slope due to be walking uphill in this case. So automatically, I can throw out two of these slopes and not even have to look at them as an option. So even if I had a guess right now, which I shouldn't have to, I'd be able to be, at least have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. And then even like with rise over run, I would almost hope you could kind of eyeball this and see the slope based off the fact that um, we either have one over one or two over one. And hopefully you see it's going more uphill than it is like right. So we go up two and over one. So kind of using a little bit of kind of just common sense, but also a little bit of math sense there with that. Um, so realizing that we can kind of do some elimination and don't have to spend a long time on this question overthinking it. We don't have to like use the slope formula. We can just kind of like kind of eyeball some of that as well. 
Now, number two might take a little bit longer here because it's asking us to find the slope of the line, but then they have this kind of crazy equation, a little bit of a mess. And so we need to find the slope there. Any ideas on how to do this one? Oh, no, they don't want slope. Sorry, y-intercept. They want y-intercept. I apologize. I think they slope from the last one. They want the y-intercept. Right now, looking at it, I don't know that many of us could do that, um, could figure that out at this second the way it is. Like, it'd be really tough to, to figure that out looking at it right now. So if you're saying, well, I see there's a 12 there, it's got to be 12. It's going to involve 12, obviously. What, what form would you put this into to help you with that? What did you use? Form did, did you put it, what form did you put it in? You don't know what form that is? What's that called? You, you put it in the right form, yeah. Yeah, our slope intercept form. So that y equals mx plus b. This form allows us to know what the y intercept is very easily. So we need to get it into that form, and we know how to manipulate an equation to get it into that form. Now, this one's a little bit tougher than maybe some of the ones we saw pretty frequently, but it's not over the top difficult. You just want to get the y alone. So to get y alone here, what would you do first? What would you guys do first? Yeah. You can add three. Okay. So she's moving that 3 away from the 12y. That looks good. And so the fact that the y is on the right side, don't let that throw you off. Um, so I'm going to write this over here. So I have 3x, negative 4 plus 3 is a negative 1 equals 12y. Now already, you maybe start thinking that, ooh, these are some weird numbers. That's okay. Like, weird numbers are okay. We're not graphing it. They have multiple choice there for us. Obviously, a couple of them are fractions, so that's probably not all the realm of possibility. So I want to get my y alone, so how am I going to do that here? Yeah, divide by 12. So if I divide this by 12, I have to divide these two by 12 as well. Now, part of this I don't even care about. What part of this equation do I want to know in terms of y equals mx plus b? Hi. Yeah. We want the b. So we want to know what b is. So I don't want the part with the x. So like this part, I don't really even care about in this problem. I'm worried about the b. And so the b is the part that's not with the x. So there's our b value is negative 1 12. It's already there for us. It's already simplified. Um, so there's our y-intercept. Again, this would be not a nice one to graph. Like this would not be my top choice of problems I'd throw on a test and tell you guys to graph. But it's still doable for you guys to find that y-intercept. And so the ACT likes questions like that, where you have to solve it and do something else with it. It's kind of like you're showing two skills in one problem. So that's definitely one that um, questions like the ACT and like standardized tests like that like to ask of us. So um, we're again talking about perpendicular bisectors and angle bisectors today. Um, we're actually going through two sections, I think, if we make it all the way through here today. Um, but I think with, we'll kind of pace ourselves and take a break in the middle, but um, I think both of these go pretty closely together. It's just taking good notes and making sure we're um, making these two very clear differences between the two. So we're learning perpendicular bisectors and angle bisectors. Remember yesterday we learned about mid-segments, so um, we're just adding another type of line in a triangle. So I'm going to define what a perpendicular bisector is, and I'll show you down here. So a perpendicular bisector is a line. So starting off with a line. And now the perpendicular part, so that's going to be important. It's going to intersect perpendicular means what? 
What does perpendicular do? Intersects at what? Yeah. A segment at 90 degrees. And then bisector. What does a bisector do? I said it was bisected. What that do? Cut it in half, yeah, so it cuts it into two equal pieces. So perpendicular bisector is kind of an important line. It does a lot of things. There's two different things, and the name kind of gives it away. So I'll show you guys what that looks like down here in this drawing. CD would be what we call our perpendicular bisector. So I'm going to write that here. So CD, that's a line, is our perpendicular bisector. So CD is the perpendicular bisector. I'll show you guys why that is. So this line CD, so the name again gives it away, perpendicular. CD is perpendicular to AB, it gives us that, that right angle intersection, but it also bisects AB, it cuts AB into two equal pieces. So CD is a perpendicular bisector, it does both of those things. So again, the name explains what it does, it's hopefully not a hard one to remember what it actually is happening there. So CD is that perpendicular bisector. Now this theorem, what it tells us is something always happens when this is the case. So, um, oh, I might just write the perpendicular piece. So I'm gonna write that CD is perpendicular to AB. So there's the perpendicular part. And then bisector, um, BD equals DA. So it bisects that line. So just like checking off that it does the perpendicular and bisector pieces. So being able to find a perpendicular bisector in a triangle is going to be useful. It's going to be something that we're going to ask you, like ask you, is this a perpendicular bisector? Or is it a mid-segment? Is it a different type of line? So what this theorem tells us, says if a point on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it's equidistant from the endpoints of the segment. What does that mean? They use all these big words. What does equidistant mean? What do you think? It's a good question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> equidistant, what do you think? Yeah, equal and distance. So the same distance. Why don't they just say that? Why don't they just say congruent? I don't know. They try to be fancy sometimes. So if a point is on the perpendicular bisector, it's equidistant, so it's going to be the same distance from each of these sets. So this theorem tells us if we have a perpendicular bisector, then the CB is going to equal CA. That's what this theorem is telling us. That's always going to be the case, that I can draw that line and kind of make this almost into a triangle, and those two lines are going to be the same distance, so C is going to be the same distance from each of those endpoints. So that's one of those things that we know it's a perpendicular bisector. Now we can assume that that's going to be the case. Okay. So if you guys could flip the page here.
And the next part is kind of one of those technical things the book does. They flip this. So it says basically the converse of that is also the case. If a point C, so if these two are equidistant, so these two are equal, that automatically tells us CD better be a perpendicular bisector. So it's just showing you that this rule goes both ways. So it goes both um, kind of forwards and backwards. So we have a perpendicular bisector, then those lines are the same. Those lines are the same, then it's a perpendicular All right, we're going to show how this applies then with an example, and you're going to jump up here. <laughs> so we're going to have our guest um, do some examples here with us to give her, give her attention like you guys give me, but <laughs> maybe better. Okay, so um, the example says that line WY is a perpendicular bisector of XZ. Um, so we know that this line here from that, we know that this line here is a perpendicular bisector for that line there. So we're just writing right here. <laughs> so, just give her a break. The yeah. board is always so finicky. Yeah, the undo button is usually probably your best friend. And then, yeah. All right. Okay, so what do we know, like you just learned, what do we know about the relationship between X, Y, and Y, Z? Hey, ready? Yeah. Yeah, so X, Y is congruent to Y, Z. And what we're trying to find is Y, Z, and we're given X, Y. So what, what is Y, Z equal to? Yeah. Yeah. So Y, Z is equal to 15. So we got our first one. So also from that theorem, the perpendicular bisector theorem, what do we know about the relationship between Wx and Wz? Yeah. Yeah. So these ones over here are also congruent because of that perpendicular bisector theorem. So Wx is equal to 4a minus 15, and Wz is equal to a plus 12. So since we know that they are congruent or equal, what do we do to try to find a? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll set those two equations equal to each other. So we have 4a minus 15 is equal to a plus 12. So what's my first step here, trying to solve for A? What do we do first? Yeah. Subtract A. All right, yep, so subtract A, get all my A's on one side. So 4A minus A is 3A minus 15 equals 12. And then what's next? Yeah. Yep, so we add 15 to the other side. So we have 3a is equal to, anybody got it? 27. 27. And then to solve for a, we divide by 3. And we get a is equal to 9. All right, so we're not looking for a, right? We're looking for wx. So what do we do with our a to find wx? Yeah, so we'll plug our, our A, which we found was 9, back into the 4A minus 15. So we have 4 times 9 minus 15. So 4 times 9, 
is 36. So we have 36 minus 15, which is equal to but yes. So we found our WX and our YZ, or our YZ was equal to 15, like we found earlier, and WX is equal to 21. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot we can know from these, and it's just kind of being comfortable knowing that we can make those assumptions if they tell it's a perpendicular bisector. So let me, um, we're going to go through this last definition, and then we'll do, um, we'll do like just a quick break, because um, you guys have been writing a long time. So um, I want to show you guys something called, something's called the circumcenter, um, which sounds very fancy, but it's not really all that fancy. Um, so P is the circumcenter in this case. I think when I first started teaching, I might have slipped and said something other than circumcenter for this, by the way. So, um, so hopefully that doesn't slip back out. But if you're curious, you can ask your friends later. But um, yeah, so yeah, one of those weird words. So um, we have our circumcenter. Um, it basically the circumcenter is where all our perpendicular bisectors meet. So if we draw all three perpendicular bisectors, that circumcenter is where those three meet. And the perpendicular bisectors, remember, are the ones that are cutting the one side in half and are perpendicular to that. So that's like PD is a perpendicular bisector, PE, and also PF. These are all our perpendicular bisectors, and where they meet is called a circumcenter. And that's one of those important, like, spots in a triangle that just need to be used for different things. Right now, they probably um, don't seem all that useful to us. Now, one of the kind of interesting things about that circumcenter is that point P is the same distance from all the edges. So um, my drawing is not very good for this. So it's kind of, wait, hang on. No, it's equidistant to each vertex. Sorry, my drawing's bad for that too. But um, So that point P, Point P is equidistant to each vertex. So that means if I draw a line from P to B, P to C, P to A, that distance is always going to be the same. So that blue line there that, that they kind of have drawn, that thicker blue line, those are all equidistant. Now, if you have more interest in this, um, this circumcenter line here, um, there's this website. So if you're ever looking for something to kill some time with, I'm sure you guys are going to be like all over this. I'm joking, of course. Um, so let me see if I can make it bigger. So there's this um, website that allows us to um, draw the circumcenter. And then we can move this change this triangle around so that the circumcenter even can be outside the shape sometimes. So um, so circumcenter can be in the shape, it can be on the line, or it can be outside. So you can kind of move this around and see these different ways that this line, like, or where that point shows up in our triangle. So um, I have three little drawings there that the circumcenter can be either, either be on the interior, exterior, or the, on the side of a triangle. So this website allows you to kind of play along with that. Um, there's, um, there's more centers we'll talk about in the next few days, but this is just one of them. So um, we're going to do something a little bit different for our break today here. Um, I'm just trying to vary things up every once in a while. 
Um, I was hoping to be nice enough to go outside. Maybe by Friday in the morning it'll be warm enough to go outside. I think Friday is supposed to be like almost up to like 70 degrees, so might be our last hurrah outside. Um, but why don't I get you guys up um, and kind of like if you guys can kind of go around maybe the outside of the room, kind of make like a circle as best we can. Um, we're going to do like um, kind of a goofy little just game quick. So if you guys want to kind of the perimeter of the room here. Get you guys up and move in. All right. Oh, you guys want to say hi to them? Oh, Ellen, you want to be right on the video? <laughs> we might pause it. They probably don't need our game. All right. So 